Welcome back to the Band-Aid Man OC, your source for EMT, EMR, and sports med education. You are probably in one of my classes, so be sure to check in on the Google Classroom and Google Drive for this and all other PowerPoint presentations if you'd like to follow along. If you are just joining us for the first time, this channel is all about education related to EMT, EMR, and sports medicine. Be sure to check out our other videos, and as always, Make sure that you like, subscribe, and comment if you have any questions or concerns. We'll go ahead and get started. Now, today we're going to be talking about the hematologic system and the renal system. And we're going to be breaking that down into easier to digest components. So let's uh, go ahead and jump in. First and foremost, we need to talk about blood. And specifically, we're talking about human blood. So if you have any other questions about the kind of blood that we're talking about, this might not be the right chapter for you to jump in on. The blood is going to be represented as its own organ system, and it does have its own functions. The blood in a human has the ability to control bleeding by clotting, has the ability and has the primary function of uh, delivering oxygen to cells. It also helps by removing carbon dioxide from cells. And it also helps with the removal and delivery of other waste products and uh, filtration. Now, the blood is made up of four components. Red blood cells, which primarily transport oxygenated blood via hemoglobin. White blood cells that help fight off infection. Platelets that uh, are our primary source for clotting components. And then we have the uh, component of plasma, which makes up the majority of the blood itself. Now, since we're talking about the hematologic and renal systems, it's important to remember that all medications that are ingested by humans are going to be transported at some point by the blood. So remember that some of these medications that we're talking about, and specifically we're going to be talking about blood thinners, they can affect some of these components, specifically the ability to clot. So let's talk a little bit about blood clotting. Aggregation of platelets is the way that your body stops bleeding. And the best way to describe that is if you were to think of a leak. If you have a leak in a boat or a leak in some type of a, a vessel that carries fluid, you have to think that the best way for you to go ahead and stop that leak is to empty the vessel. If we empty our vessel, our body of all the blood, we will die. So instead of simply emptying out all the leaking blood, we want to go ahead and we want to plug it up. Now, for the most part, especially when you're healthy and you're not taking any medications that inhibit the ability of your blood to clot, our body is going to be able to create clots and stop bleeding on its own, usually in about two to five minutes. However, if we have an issue with the ability to clot, whether it be something that we're born with or something that we are experiencing due to uh, medication, uh, it's going to be super important to uh, remember that the bleeding is going to need to be assisted so that we can stop that process from happening. Now, these clotting factors that, uh, that naturally occur in the healthy human are uh, found in proteins that are produced by the liver and then released into the bloodstream. And once they are activated, these clotting factors will form clots through uh, cascade systems that provide clotting to wherever the body needs it. Now, when we're talking about coagulopathies, which is a very fun word for issues with clotting, we have to remember that it can be from a lot of different variant issues. It could be medication related. It could also be related to some type of disease process or even a congenital disorder that uh, our patient was born with. Some of these diseases like liver disease, hemophilia, von Willebrand disease, they are going to make the patient much more susceptible to high volume blood loss in the event that they sustain a cut. And depending on the severity of the inability of the blood to clot, will kind of determine how much blood they lose and how quickly. It'll also determine how difficult it will be for us to establish an effective uh, bleeding control scheme as we are responding to them in EMS. So we need to talk about patients with these coagulopathies. So let's, uh, let's go into a little bit more depth. Some of these patients, especially patients that are at high risk for stroke or have had a previous stroke, have some type of a cardiac condition like atrial fibrillation, 
or for another reason that uh, we haven't quite gotten into yet, are in need of some type of medication to prevent the blood from clotting at a high rate, they'll be, they will be prescribed by their doctor something known as a blood thinner. These blood thinners are widespread. They are some of the most prescribed medications that we encounter as EMS professionals. And because they are so prevalent and because they can impact patient survivability, especially during traumatic injury so much, we have very specific protocol on how to go ahead and take care of a patient who has sustained an injury and is bleeding while on blood thinners. So remember these key points. Some patients will not have the ability to clot on their own due to a disease or disorder. Other patients will not have the ability to form effective clots because of a medication. All patients with a blood clotting disorder, whether it be medication related or congenital or disease related, must be treated with aggressive bleeding control. That goes back to the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. We're talking about C, circulation. So this is going to be in the realm of immediate life-threatening disease, disorder, or injury. So let's talk about anemia. When we say anemia, we're saying that the patient has a lack of normal red blood cells. This can happen in two different scenarios, either due to an acute cause like trauma, where we have a sudden loss of blood, or due to a chronic problem like excessive menstrual periods, uh, slow GI bleeds, or some diseases that affect bone marrow. With some diseases, we find that the coagulopathy is lifelong. It's something that the patient is born with and that they will need to navigate their life with. And one of the most common is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease that affects red, red blood cells. And here on the slide, it says RBCs, just so everyone knows that means red blood cell. It's more prevalent in certain ethnicities. Uh, here in the United States, we find it more in African-Americans and those of Indian or Middle Eastern descent. And sickle cell anemia is when some of the blood cells are in the shape of a sickle. Or for those of you that don't know quite what a sickle looks like, it's more like a half moon or a crescent moon. These cells do not have a full cell life, which means that they are not going to live as long as normal red blood cells. And because of their unique shape, they can both clump up in a negative fashion, not when we're looking for uh, some type of stoppage of bleeding, which would normally be via platelets, not red blood cells, but they can also lacerate and tear certain healthy red blood cells that are not in the shape of a sickle or of the crescent or half moon shape. So sickle cell anemia has a lot of complications and it would take too long to go through all of those complications, but I want to focus on some of the more common ones. Some of those common complications would be destruction of the spleen, sickle pain crisis, acute coronary syndrome or ACS, which we've already talked about in our cardiac lecture, priapism, which is typically only found in trauma, as well as stroke and jaundice. Now, sickle cell anemia, as we've stated before, is found in higher numbers in certain ethnic groups. So much so that one in 12 African Americans has the trait for sickle cell. Now, that doesn't always mean that it's going to lead to complications, but remember that once you are presenting with these cells in the bloodstream, the trait no longer is part of the equation. You have sickle cell anemia. And that'll take you back to what we talked about in the previous slide. Now that we've discussed the different types of issues with red blood cells, we should discuss patient care. Because the issues that we talked about in the previous slides affect red blood cells, it would make sense that our patient is going to primarily have issues with oxygenation. So the very first step, and if you've been in my class before, you've already heard me say that it's important to preserve our patient based off of their needs. And if a patient does not need oxygen, then we don't need to go and put them on oxygen right away. 
we have tools and we have the ability to determine if they're a good candidate for oxygen. That may not be the way that your agency or your company or even your training officer wants you to operate, but it does have its own place in good medical science. So what are some things that we can do to try to figure out if our patient really needs oxygen? Well, first and foremost, we can look at their breathing and we can look at their effort of breathing. If the patient is complaining of shortness of breath or difficulty of breathing, then that would be a good time for us to perhaps consider putting them on oxygen. And their difficulty of breathing or shortness of breath should really be determined based off of how much effort they're putting in to breathe. If they're able to speak in full sentences and their respiratory rate is within a normal range for their age, then it would probably be more appropriate to place them on a nasal cannula at a rate anywhere between one to six liters per minute or whatever your local EMS agency dictates. However, if your patient is unable to speak in full sentences, and we call that clipped sentences or clipped conversations, or they are working for every single breath, that patient first and foremost needs to be placed on a non-rebreather mask, and we need to expedite their transport because as a BLS provider, our ability to maintain their airway is fairly limited. So make sure that we're using those assessment tools that we've developed in our time in the program that you're in, whether it's mine or a different program, and look at your patient. So many providers depend on tools that are not exactly 100% reliable. And again, if you've been in my course, you already know what I'm about to say, that SpO2. Your pulse oximeter is one of the tools that gets leaned on a lot and ends up being wrong a lot. Now, there's an entire segment of videos that you can check out on airway management and issues with breathing, but I want to tell you right now that if you're using your SpO2 on every patient and you immediately start placing patients on oxygen when they fall below a uh, oxygen saturation level of 95%, you're not truly looking at your patient. And seasoned veterans, EMTs and paramedics alike will tell you that the pulse ox is one of the easiest tools to get tripped up by. So be sure to use that one after, and really only after you do your, your assessment as the trained EMT. Now, we've talked about the rest of the bullet points here, inadequate respiration, signs of hypoperfusion, um, and obviously, you know, work of breathing, effort of breathing is not going to tell us a whole story. Look at your patient's skin signs, look at cap refill, and look at their overall skin presentation to tell you if oxygen is appropriate. Now, the bullet point on this, and I want to reiterate that these PowerPoints are developed by our publisher, so I don't wanna to deviate too far from the source material. Um, we do need to do a stroke assessment before we take a patient to a stroke center, and that is in a different chapter. So make sure that you check in on that. All right, now that we've talked about the blood as an organ, and we've talked a little bit about some of these issues with the blood itself, we need to talk about the filter, the renal system. Now the renal system is comprised of a couple of different organ systems and a couple of different aspects of the body. It's comprised of two kidneys in a healthy patient, two ureters and one urethra. These kidneys, the ureters and the urethra are responsible for filtering blood and then ultimately removing waste through urine. This, also, this system also helps us uh, maintain fluid balance and it also helps us maintain our acid base balance. Now, when we're talking about diseases of the renal system, we are dealing with diseases that primarily affect the kidneys. There are other areas where this disease can affect other areas, but at the end of the day, the largest organ that's being affected is the kidneys. These can range from not a very big deal to a very big deal, and we're gonna go into a little bit more depth on that on the next few slides. So let's talk about the, one of the most common renal system issues, which would be UTIs. Now I'm definitely talking to the uh, folks out there that uh, have worked in the field. UTIs are something that we see a lot, and typically we see these with patients that are doing some type of 
catheterization. They don't have the ability to utilize their bladder and urinate normally, so they have to use some type of a device to extract the urine in a uh, passive sense or uh, every time they feel they have the need to urinate. So these UTIs are pretty common. They are the source of a lot of more serious infections, and uh, if left untreated, it can lead to sepsis and death. So UTIs are certainly something that aren't pleasant to deal with, but we don't want to write them off as just another call. And if you could see me, you know that I'm doing air quotes because UTIs, especially when they are in a community living setting like a skilled nursing facility or SNF or some type of uh, other area where we have a lot of people living in a close communal sense, uh, UTIs are pretty rampant. These are caused by bacteria. It's typically lit li li limited to the bladder. Sorry about that, guys. And uh, it causes pain and frequent urination. Now, if we leave this untreated, it'll lead to pyelonephritis, which is a UTI that has traveled up the ureter and into the kidney. And at that point, we can lead to infections that get into the bloodstream. When infections lead themselves into the bloodstream, we have a systemic infection, and that is where we get into a real concern for sepsis. Now, we're moving on from UTIs to kidney stones. This is going to be a lot of the same material, but instead of an infection that starts at the bladder and travels up through the kidneys, this is going to be something that starts in the kidneys and then eventually is passed down the ureters into the urethra, and if it's small enough, passed in the urine and excrete it from the body. When these kidney stones are in, well, let me back up a little bit. These kidney stones are made of calcium. They're formed within the kidney. And if they're small enough, they are passed through the uh, process of urination and excreted from the body. When they're up in the kidney, they don't have any symptoms. But when they become dislodged, they become very painful. And if you have ever had a kidney stone before, you can go ahead and comment below. The most common medical knowledge states that kidney stones are the closest that a male would be able to experience to the pain involved with childbirth in females. So if that gives you an indication of how painful this process of passing kidney stones is, that, that should tell you that your patient, if you encounter them with kidney stones, they're going to be in extreme pain, 10 out of 10. These patients will complain of unilateral flank pain that uh, radiates to the groin, so pain from the back that radiates to the groin, and uh, they may uh, report nausea and vomiting. These patients may also state that they are having significant difficulty with urinating, and that could mean that one of the kidney stones is lodged in the urethra. That's not a very common complaint, but certainly something that we want to take care of because if our patient can't properly relieve themselves, that can lead to issues further up the line with the bladder, the ureters, and the kidneys themselves. Now, we've already sort of talked about urinary catheters, and we talked about how they can lead to UTIs, but let's go into a little bit more depth. Urinary catheters uh, can be prescribed to a patient for a number of different reasons, but at the end of the day, they're all doing the same thing. They're bypassing all of the systems that are below the bladder itself. They're bypassing all of the all of the systems to make sure that as soon as fluid is in the bladder that it doesn't leak out of the urethra. And it is emptying these, it is emptying the bladder uh, at the user's, uh, either at the user's insertion or as soon as there's enough fluid to be effectively drained. We have what are known as indwelling catheters, and that's very common in these skilled nursing facilities or um, patients that are being transport, transferred from one facility to another. And then we'll have some patients that use a process called self-catheterization. So every time they feel that they have the need to urinate or uh, they, they know that they have not uh, emptied their bladder in a few hours, they'll go ahead and they'll insert these devices into the urethra and bypass all of the systems set in place to keep urine in and then uh, vacate into the toilet. So as we've already discussed, urinary catheters are one of the most common causes of UTIs. So one of our most commonly seen patients in the geriatric side of things is going to be urinary tract infections. 
and it'll be a secondary to a, a urinary catheter. So again, and I really want to stress this, don't discount the patient with a UTI as just another BLS call. These can lead to really big complications, and in the past, they've led to uh, undetected sepsis. And once the patient becomes septic, they tend to decline pretty quickly. So we really want to take that seriously. So renal failure, and this is going to be the probably the biggest component of this lecture and of this PowerPoint. Renal failure is talking about how the kidneys lose their ability to be a filter. As the kidneys are filters, they are effectively removing the toxic material from the bloodstream and from the body, and then it's being excreted from the, uh, from the patient through urination. Acute failure, and as always, we're talking about acute versus chronic, acute being very fast, very rapid onset, chronic being something that takes days, weeks, months, even years, uh, and in some cases, decades to uh, become a uh, parent. So let's talk about acute. Acute is typically from shock or toxic ingestion or some type of exposure to a toxic material. Whereas chronic, which is uh, more typically found as the cause for renal failure, is due to inherited damage, uh, some type of genetic disorder, or, and this is most commonly found here in the US, uh, due to uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension. And we're gonna talk about how we deal with that as a medical community here in the US. One of the phrases that you'll hear, especially as you go into the field and really uh, much more commonly in the non-emergency or inter-facility transport side of things is a disease that we refer to as end-stage renal disease or ESRD. ESRD is a big fancy name for renal failure that is irreversible. This is the very last stage of renal failure and it is the most common cause of the need for hemodialysis. Now hemodialysis and uh, to a, another degree peritoneal dialysis um, is a process where blood is pulled out of the body it is run through filters and then it is brought back into the body. And we're going to talk about that more in some of the uh, upcoming slides. So be sure to uh, write that down and we'll revisit it. Now, here in the US, we have a very large number of patients that are in ESRD and they are required to go to a doctor's office, basically, or really a specialized center for a process known as hemodialysis. So that number there, 90%, is 90% of the, the patients here in the U.S. that are receiving hemodialysis. So let's talk about hemodialysis. Dialysis is a process, again, where the blood is filtered from the body and then put back in. These dialysis centers are open typically Monday through Saturday, and some of them are open Sunday. They typically open very, very early in the morning and they are open until about four or five in the afternoon, sometimes later, and they see over 400,000 Americans on a weekly basis. Hemodialysis is a process that needs to be done on a regular basis, and typically patients will go for a two, three, or even four-hour session three times a week. So patients that miss treatments typically end up becoming emergency patients because their body is very quickly becoming toxic. Uh, just to hit that second bullet point, only 8% treat themselves at home. That is due to the uh, immense cost as well as the cumbersome equipment that comes with dialysis. And because of that cost, most patients will opt or be required to go to a treatment center. Now, patients that are on dialysis in the past have uh, pretty heavily relied on ambulance transportation to and from their appointments. But in the last couple of years, that number has dropped because there was a lot of abuse of that, uh, of that form of transportation. Patients will now frequently drive themselves to and from dialysis. And if they're not able to because they are bound to a wheelchair, they'll be taken by wheelchair van. Only the most infirm or the most sick patients need to be taken by ambulance. And there are still thousands of patients, probably tens of thousands of patients that go via ambulance to dialysis centers every day. So there are certain parts of the country where the 
number of patients in a certain area are so great that an ambulance company and an ambulance crew can basically plan out their day transporting nothing but dialysis patients to and from their appointments. It's a very common tactic with uh, some smaller companies, and it is certainly seen more in our large municipal, or our large metropolitan areas. And uh, because of the area that we live in, I'm referring specifically to areas like Los Angeles, San Diego, and others. So hemodialysis is a pretty, pretty neat process. We found that since the kidneys are no longer acting as a filter, we're able to go ahead and utilize the, utilize the machine that is sitting next to the patient as basically a gigantic filter. So the blood is removed from the patient via a fistula or some type of uh, subclavian device. It is brought through the machine, through a series of filters, and through a system of checks and balances. It is uh, made clean and then pumped back into the patient while also ensuring that uh, things like uh, foreign material or toxic material or air bubbles are not pumped back into the patient. Like I said before, these treatments last for several hours, and the average patient will go for three to four hour treatments about three times a week. Now this diagram will show how a patient with an AV fistula will receive this treatment. As you can see, over on the side closest to the radius, the patient is having blood removed from their body. This blood goes down the tubing, is checked by an arterial blood pressure monitor, and then sent through a pump. That pump is followed by a dose of heparin, which is a blood thinner, an antiplatelet or anticoagulant med medication, then flows further down, hits another pressure monitor, and then goes through the dialyzer. And I said that like that because secretly I think I wanna be a redneck out in Texas somewhere. So we hit the dialyzer and then it runs through the rest of the line to the venous pressure monitor and then goes through an air trap and air detector. Now the reason that that air trap and air detector is so close to where the patient is receiving it is because pumping blood with air bubbles into the patient can cause the patient to have a very negative reaction. It can cause them to have all sorts of complications that we We'll talk about in another chapter. And then uh, we've got the air detector clamp. If that uh, line feels, or if the machine feels like there's air in the line, it'll go ahead and shut down and alarm. And then they'll have to go ahead and troubleshoot and figure out why it's doing that. And then finally, the blood travels back into the patient's bloodstream and they now have cleaned blood. So hemodialysis is typically done through two types of access points. The two port catheter, which is typically found under the clavicle, that's why I said earlier, the subclavian catheter and the AV fistula. The AV fistula is a surgically implanted device. It's typically found somewhere on the forearm or lower arm of the patient, left or right. And it looks like two bumps. And we're gonna look at a couple of these pictures. And uh, that, that last bullet point about characteristic thrill, what they're talking about is the feeling of blood that's going through that system. It feels much different than the uh, normal blood flow through the body because it's being powered through. So what you're looking at here is a patient that has a two-port catheter, and this is the atypical subclavian. From the information that you can look online, these are typically set for temporary access on a patient that has not been cleared for an AV fistula. And typically these are used for a short period of time. So these are not going to be found very often on your patients in hemodialysis, at least not for a long period. The hemodialysis that's done normally is through what's known as an AV fistula. And you'll see a deformity typically in the forearm and sometimes uh, further up on the bicep uh, where the patient will be able to have blood drawn and then returned into the body. These are done through fairly large bore needles that are placed by specialized technicians that work in dialysis centers. Now, we do wanna talk a little bit about peritoneal dialysis, but this is by far less common than hemodialysis. Uh, 
Um, this is using the peritoneal cavities, large surface area, so on the uh, on the stomach there, and it uh, has some type of special fluid that's infused into the abdominal cavity, and then it is left inside for a few hours to absorb excess waste and fluid. And then as soon as that process is complete, the fluid is pulled back out and discarded. Now, the peritoneal dialysis is done is through these two processes, uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, where you have a gravity pump. So as long as you're standing upright or uh, not hanging upside down by your ankles, uh, the machine, or I'm sorry, the device should work. And then you've got continuous cycler assisted peritoneal dialysis, CCPD, where you have a machine that is uh, being used to fill and empty the abdominal cavity while the patient sleeps. As I said before, this is uh, certainly not the norm. And uh, what you're going to see more often are from the slides that we just saw with the patient who is on a, an AV fistula access point or a two-port catheter access. So this is a picture of what peritoneal dialysis looks like. And you can see that this patient has a tube that is running from their abdomen and it's just on the left side on the lower uh the lower left quadrant and it's being pulled out through uh what looks like a uh, ported filter device so let's talk about some of the more common medical emergencies that we see with patients that are suffering from esrd or end-stage renal disease we have two pretty broad groups and we're going to break it down right now We've got patients that have lost their normal kidney function due to disease, disorder, overdose, um, exposure to toxic chemicals or toxic materials. And then uh, our more common uh, need for dialysis is because, or I'm sorry, our more common medical emergency is due to complications from dialysis treatments. So our patients typically in EMS will be going to, to dialysis as a result of uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled di hypertension, or a combination of the two. And they do tend to happen in, in conjunction with one another. Uncontrolled diabetes leads to uncontrolled hypertension, and so on and so forth. Uh, just so we're clear, uncontrolled hypertension does not lead to uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, that's kind of a one-way street. So let's, uh, let's dive into that a little bit. Now, one of the more common calls that we get is for a patient that is feeling ill, sick, sluggish, lethargic, and if they're having dialysis done on a regular basis and they miss one of their treatments, they can, uh, it can pretty negatively affect their body's ability to filter out toxins, obviously. And when they miss treatments uh, for days or weeks in a row, they are going to feel pretty bad. Some of these uh, more common chief complaints would be shortness of breath, edema, or pooling of fluid that's uh, under the skin, typically in the feet, ankles, and lower extremities, and then disturbances with electrolyte balance. So to discuss patient care, we need to assume that our patient that has ESRD is going on a regular basis. And this is where getting a good history and, and really doing a detailed exam is going to help you the most. But remember, before we get to any of that, we need to assess the ABCs and treat any life threats. Make sure that we get vital signs. And I'm gonna stop real quick and I'm going to put in a very important note. Fistulas, those, uh, Implant, surgically implanted devices that are under the skin are accessing the venous and arterial flow of the patient's bloodstream. If you apply a blood pressure cuff to that limb, you can cause that device to be dislodged and you can cause pretty significant bleeding. Now, regardless of what bleeding it is, whether it's venous or arterial, because you've just taken that device out, your patient is going to desaturate pretty quickly and you're going to have basically internal bleeding very quickly uh, affecting your patient's overall health. So anytime that we have a patient with some type of a fistula, it is not acceptable to get a blood pressure on that limb. I want to repeat that. Patients with fistulas, 
may not have a blood pressure taken on that limb. Learn it, love it, live it. A patient has not died because we were unable to get a blood pressure. Patients die because we are not paying attention to our uh, class and education. Now, once we've established what the vital signs are, uh, we want to go ahead and treat any underlying, dis underlying disorders. If the patient is severely hyper or hypotensive, if the patient is severely tachycardic or bradycardic, if the patient is severely um, bradyapneic or tachypneic, we want to go ahead and treat those issues. And then, of course, we want to monitor those vital signs throughout the transport, apply oxygen if appropriate, and then transport to a facility that's capable of dialysis. Now, here where I teach in California, all of our hospitals have the ability to perform emergency dialysis in the emergency department. But if you're working or learning in an area that is much smaller, has uh, less capability, it's important to note that reaching out to these hospitals, making contact, based contact, or uh, reaching out to ALS will probably be the way that we determine if the patient should go to that hospital or not. Remember, we're taking them to the hospital as a result of missing dialysis. So taking them to a hospital that can't provide that service is only going to delay care. Now, we've talked about issues that stem from ESRD. Let's talk about complications from dialysis. Dialysis is a pretty, pretty common medical procedure but as always, there can be complications. One of the most common is gonna be bleeding from the AV fistula site. Remember, it's a device that's for the patient's skin and it is in their artery and in their vein. It's directly part of that line. So when they access using needles, we wanna make sure that they are properly clamped before we initiate transport and make sure that the bleeding is stopped at the site. Typically, when we're called out to these dialysis centers, we're being called out either to take them home if it's an inter-facility non-emergency transport, but when it's an emergency or a non-scheduled transport, it's because there's a complication. So just like any other patient that's having bleeding, we need to follow our bleeding control scheme and our bleeding control protocol and procedure where we work. And we'll talk about that more in another chapter. Another issue can be clotting or loss of function at the AV fistula. That's definitely less common. And typically that's going to mean that the patient needs to be removed from the dialysis center and taken to an emergency department so that they can be evaluated and treated by the doctors there. More often than not, that means that uh, that AV fistula is no longer going to function and they'll need to surgically implant another one. So that patient will probably be placed a short-term on a two catheter, two port catheter system, subclavian. And then when the surgical schedule opens up, they'll be able to go ahead and place that AV fistula. And then of course, because we are accessing the patient's veins and arteries through external sources, through needles, bacterial infection is always something that, of pretty high concern. So, whether that be introduced by needles or introduced through other manner, um, it's a pretty, a pretty significant issue because as soon as that infection enters the bloodstream, it's being circulated throughout the entire body. And again, that's how we lead ourselves to sepsis. So it's super important to remember that patients that are receiving any type of dialysis are at much higher risk for bacterial infection. So take the proper protocol to reduce infection risk and if it's absolutely something that you're concerned about, it's probably worthwhile to at least put on a surgical mask if you are concerned about your own health and the health of your patient on the other end. So with ESRD, uh, our patient is going to be going basically to a planned doctor's appointment three times a week for three hours a day. It's a big part of their life. And as I stated earlier, that's why these centers open at three o'clock in the morning. A lot of these people are still working. If you're starting uh, your dialysis treatment at three in the morning and it's about three, three and a half hours, you're out of there by 6.30, which means you can go home, get ready to go, and you're off to work. But that's not always going to be the, the case with all of your patients. So it's important to remember that these patients are already compromised. They already have a significant health issue.
because ESRD is so prevalent, many providers in my experience are mostly unfazed by a patient with a history of ESRD. And while I can understand how a heavy patient load with patients with ESRD can numb us up a bit to the, compli the possible complications, it's really important to remember that these are patients that are very fragile. So we need to make sure that we are taking all the necessary precautions to make sure that we're not introducing new infection. But before we get anywhere near that stuff, we need to make sure there's nothing that's going to kill them right away. So assess those ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. And then if it is a bleeding issue, make sure that we're using direct pressure and uh, depending on where you work, following through with that bleeding control scheme. Locally here, we utilize direct pressure, bandaging, and in an extreme event where we're unable to control bleeding, we'll utilize a tourniquet. We'll talk about that further down the line. And then of course, with a patient with any patient with uncontrolled bleeding, we should always consider the application of supplemental oxygen. With regard to ESRD patients that are suffering from complications of dialysis, it's important we start by treating for shock. And the reason why is because our patient that is under dialysis care is having their blood removed from the body and filtered through uh, an outside source and then put back in. So in some way, shape, or form, our patient is really having all of their blood removed, almost like a medical vampire. So if there is some type of a disorder or some type of an issue with uncontrolled bleeding at the site or, God forbid, some type of a major malfunction with the machine where it starts spraying the entire room with blood like it's a crazy horror movie, that's going to be our, our patient that needs shock treatment the most. So keep them supine, keep them warm, high flow O2, and you need to go ahead and pretty rapidly transport. And as we have discussed earlier, hemodialysis is going to be the lion's share of your dialysis patients. If it is a peritoneal patient, make sure that if you're thinking it's peritoni peritonitis, that we transport uh, our dialysis fluid sample for confirmation. And your agency or company will have better guidelines on that. Patients that are in ESRD will eventually be put on a list for kidney transplants. Kidneys here in the United States are the most commonly transplanted organs, and we see approximately 16,000 transports per year. These patients are very, very susceptible to both infection as well as issues with organ rejection. So if you've ever known someone that was on a list for an organ, you already know that they can't just take any organ. We can't find some organ laying around and just stick it in. It has to be a match. So these patients are very medically fragile. They need to be on a host of different drugs. They also need to be very closely monitored. And patients that are receiving kidneys are at this point taken on a best case survival scenario. So what does that mean? If a patient, because of their personal history or their social history, and we're talking about the use of drugs and alcohol or other destructive behaviors, will be placed all the way down at the very bottom of the list. Whereas our patients with a very, very good chance of survival will be right up at the top. And that's going to be our little guys and gals, our little kiddos, as well as our patients that are experiencing kidney failure as a result of something that is not necessarily their fault. There's an entire lecture that we could get into about the ethics of this. It's certainly a hot button issue in medicine today, but we aren't going to go that deep into it today with our lecture. So just understand that these kidney transplants are pretty fraught with a host of issues. But as the provider, we're not really worried about that. We're worried about their susceptibility to infection, disease, as well as being very very, very immunocompromised. So we have gone over the entirety of chapter 24 with regard to hematologic and renal issues. So 
Let's go ahead and do that review. Remember, blood delivers oxygen to the cells. It removes carbon dioxide from the cells, and it controls bleeding by, by clotting. Blood consists of four components, red blood cells or RBCs, white blood cells or WBCs, plasma, and platelets. Anemia is a lack of red blood cells in circulation, and that can be due to a host of different issues. Sickle cell anemia is a very specific type of anemia, and it is an inherited disease where a defect in the hemoglobin results in a sickle shape of red blood cells. This causes a real issue with movement of red blood cells through the capillaries, and it will create a sludging effect and blockages in smaller blood vessels. And these blood vessels can also damage healthy cells because of their shape. The renal system is comprised of the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra, and the kidneys are our body's filter. They filter the blood to remove waste products, and that waste product is taken out of the body through the process of urination. Renal system issues include infection, kidney stones, renal failure, and a host of other issues. And these failures of the renal system can result in the need for hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Dialysis removes excess fluid and electrolytes from the body by filtration, and it can be done in one of two ways, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis is the most common form. It's typically done at dialysis centers three times per week. And on the other side, peritoneal dialysis is typically done at home and is usually done several times daily. Complications with end-stage renal disease can occur after the patient has missed dialysis appointments from infections, or because of complications directly stemming from their hemodialysis treatment at access sites and the inability to stop bleeding. Remember that blood has very specific cellular components that we just talked about a few slides ago. Abnormal blood cells can significantly affect patients' health and their ability to fight off infection, disease, and recover from injuries. The renal system is critical to maintaining homeostasis, which is that great big H word that we're always trying to keep our patients in. Renal failure can be either chronic or acute, and end-stage renal disease is managed through dialysis. Some things that you want to consider when you're dealing with a patient that is going through dialysis is, does my patient have a history of sickle cell or ESRD? And furthermore, do they have any other history of anemia? whether it be due to disease processes, or are they inhibited in their ability to do things like clotting because of medications like blood thinners? Does my patient have an AV fistula? And remember, if your patient has an AV fistula, it will always be unacceptable to take a blood pressure on that arm. And then remember, do I need to consult for ALS? This is the big golden question of everything that we do as EMTs in the field. Is this something that I can handle with my crew, myself, my partner, my equipment, and whatever that is at your local equivalent, and with my ability to get the patient to the hospital quickly? So that's one of the biggest questions that we ask besides ABCs. Are the ABCs good? Great. Do we need the ALS? I know that that sounds like a ridiculous statement, but it's true. Is this something that we can handle? So the very last slide is a critical thinking slide. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna leave this up so that you guys are able to take a look and really contemplate if that's something that you would be able to handle as a BLS crew. Now, what it says here is you have a patient who is transported routinely for dialysis three times per week. She was sick and she canceled the trip. She's now calling saying that she can't breathe and she feels like she's going to die. Those should be some pretty good indicators. This patient isn't doing very well. Is it possible that she has a legitimate complaint after missing dialysis by only one day? This is a great opportunity for you to stretch those muscles up in the gray matter, up in your brain, to tell me if you are going to transport this patient as an emergency, as a 
a legitimate life-threatening call. If they're going to go as non-emergency or will be referred to transport themselves. And uh, furthermore, if this is going to be something that we should involve ALS in. Now, I realize that that is going to be absolutely determined by where you work and who you work for and what your capabilities are. But go ahead and throw your comment down below and let us know what that looks like. So this is our very last slide. If you're following along with the notes in the Google Classroom and in our drive, you'll know that this is our very last slide. There are a couple slides missing, and that's for copyright purposes because we don't want to disrespect the copyrights that are in place for the videos that were embedded by our publisher. So you can go ahead and take a look at those videos and they are great resources. It was great talking to all of you today. I appreciate all of your help. If you're one of my EMT students, I can't wait to see you back in class. Be sure to go out there, do good work, be safe, and as always, be well. Bye.